know why you're here this morning. I don't know what made you wake up this morning. I don't know if you were just tired of staying in the same bed, thinking about the same situations, the same problems over and over. I don't know if that's what got you out of bed this morning. I don't know if you just realized that God has been too good to you this morning, too good to you the past week, the past month, that you couldn't stay in bed no longer, that you had to come down here to Mount Vernon and to praise God and let God know that he is worthy of your praises. He is worthy of your worship. And if you will to with me this morning, will you pitch your hands together and give God some praise this morning? Amen. Before I begin, I believe it's, it's honorable to tell you, Pastor, I appreciate the opportunity to be in your pulpit. It's honor to stand here knowing that God has trusted you for over 33 years to be right here. And for you to pass that trust on to me this morning is a blessing. As you spoke of, that we had known each other for probably a little over a year, and in the little bit of time that we've got to talk and, and to share with each other, brother, you have spoke words into my heart that I will never forget. And there's things that you have spoken that I'll carry with me for a long time, and I appreciate those words. And I appreciate the encouragement. But I really appreciate you and what you're doing for the Lord right here in Mount Vernon. I appreciate your dedication to stand here because I believe there's things that's probably shaken you as a pastor. And where so many other pastors would want to walk away, you stood because you knew that God wanted you right here. God pitched you here for a reason, brother. And you've carried that out, and we appreciate that. So much. And I believe you guys would say the same thing. You appreciate knowing that you've got a pastor with that same heart, that same dedication. So why don't we put our hands together and give him some praise this morning. <laughs> the title of my message is When the Lights Go Out. When the lights go out in Georgia. No. Just when the lights go out. There was a, a funeral one time and a lady had passed away, and the pastor had got up, and, and he gave a, a short message about all the great things that she has done throughout the church and, and the different things she has accomplished as a, as a young lady. And then it came to a point where she, the pastor had asked the, the husband to stand up and to share a little bit of his memories, of his stories with her. And so this man got up and he, and he walked in front of his family and his friends and he said of all the memories I can think about and all the stories and all the blessings that she has been for my life he said I remember in the great depression he goes it was a time where we were suffering it was a time where we didn't realize and didn't know where our next meal was coming from he said it was a time that I had lost my job and it was a time that every day I got up every morning because I knew I couldn't just stay there. I had to get out because I had to find something, some kind of work. And he said, and some days I would go out and I would find work. And then there was days that I would come home with nothing. And he said, and it was hard on me and it was hard on my wife. And we cried about it. And he said that one day, he goes, I was coming home from work and I got home just to tell my wife that I was gone all day, but I didn't have no job. And he goes, I came home and I, I walked in the house to find out when I opened the door, there was candles lit. And it was a walkway to the kitchen. And he goes, and I walked through the candlelights and I walked into the kitchen and she had prepared a meal and she had lit a candle in the middle of the table. And he goes, what's going on? And she said, well, I know that everything's been bad lately. Everything hasn't seemed right. And there's been so much stress. And everything, every door that we look into, it just seems like it closes. And she said, so tonight I wanted to put all the worries away. And she said, I wanted to enjoy my husband tonight. And I wanted to do that by a candlelight service or a candlelight dinner. 
And so they sat there and they enjoyed a meal. Afterwards, they went and she had lit a fire in the fireplace and they sat by the fire and they enjoyed their night together. That morning, he had got up again early in the morning and he got ready to set out again to find work and he went into the bathroom and he turned the light switch on, but the lights didn't come on. And he walked into the other room and he turned the lights on and the lights didn't come on. And he walked into the kitchen where his wife was sitting and he said, what's wrong? Why ain't the lights coming on? And she said, it's been tough lately. And she said, I just wanted to enjoy our night together. She's like, but I didn't have the heart to tell you that the power company came by and shut the power off. She said, I didn't want to ruin our day anymore and make any more stress on you. He said, I have all the stories and memories he could think about. He said, that was the moment that he remembered. The lights went out. And he remembered that he knew he married the right woman. A woman that was going to be with him no matter what. This little lot of mine was first being sung in the early 20s and early 30s. It's a song that most of us guys remember Most of us, if you grew up in church, if you went to Sunday school, you knew the song, This Little Lot of Mine. Some of you guys might have had parents and grandparents that used to sing that song to you as bedtime. But most of us knew the song, This Little Lot of Mine. And I love to sing. I really do. And I sing really good, but I sound horrible. Okay? But I love to sing. But how many of you guys know this song, This Little Lot of Mine? Do you? Will you sing with it with me this morning? You ready? This little light of mine. This little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine. Let the light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. I'm not gonna let. Hide around bush, oh no, I'm going to let it shine. I'm going to let bush, oh no, I'm going to let it shine. Hide around the bush, oh no, I'm not going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. I'm not going to let Satan. I'm going to let it shine. I'm not going to let Satan blow me down. I'm going to let it shine. I'm not going to let it blow it out. I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. What happens when your light does go blow, gets blown out? What happens when your flame gets weak because of the storms in life? What happens, church, when your light gets blown out? What happens when Satan blows that last breath, that last storm your way? And your light goes out. What happens, church? My question this morning is what do you do, church? What do you do do when your light goes out? And you find yourself all alone, feeling hopeless. Feeling like nobody cares. Feeling like no matter what you've done, no matter how hard you worked at it, it doesn't work out. It's never good enough. What happens when your visions, when your life visions doesn't come to part? What happens when your dreams don't work out? What happens when you think that you should be here, but you're not? What happens when you're in the situation where you wish that you're not in that situation? What happens when that doctor calls with that report? What happens when you answer that phone call that you wish that you'd never answer? What happens when you find yourself so angry, so mad, and you find yourself asking God, why? Why, God? Why now? Why this? Why'd you let let them die? Why'd you let me get sick? Why'd you let me answer that phone? Why this, God? Why'd you let that happen to my family? And you find yourself praying and calling out to God because that's all we know to do. 
That's all we know to do when things get tough. We cry out to God and say, God, why? Why, God? But it just seems like God didn't answer. Or it seems like God didn't give us the answer that we're looking for. And we get frustrated, don't we? Because we're hurt. And when we hurt and we don't get the answers, we get angry. And we find ourselves asking, why? Why, God? Church, have you felt that way? Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever found yourself in a situation where you wish you wasn't at? Have you ever felt like you shouldn't answer that phone call? Have you ever felt like maybe, maybe I shouldn't have went to the doctor today to get the report? Have you ever felt that way, church? Church, I was here, I was asked to bring a revival to you guys this week. But I have to be honest with you. I didn't come to preach a revival with you guys. I came to preach the word of God. And if you allow that to speak to your lives this week, I pray that God will move in your lives and move in your heart like he's never moved in your heart before. What I'm asking you to do this morning is to forget about everything that's been going on. Everything that's been leading up to now. All the heartaches, the pain, the confusion. And if you will, just block it out for just a few moments this morning. If you would just put it behind you and you will open your hearts this morning for the word of God and you will allow God to speak to you this morning, I, pr- I know without a doubt and I pray that God will move in your hearts. How many of you guys know that we need a move of God in our community? How many know that we need a move of God in our nation, in our town, in our church? How many of you guys know we need a move of God right here in our own lives? I pray that the power of God will fall on our lives like never before this morning. I pray that the same God that I had given my life up to, the same power that he changed my life, that he moved in my life, I pray that he, that same power will move in your life this morning. I pray this church gets so on fire for Christ. So on fire that everywhere outside has to draw near. Because when you're cold, you got to get close to the warmth, right? When you're cold, you look for the fire to get warm. And when you're dark and in a dark room, you look for that light. And when you see that light, you have no choice but to run to that light. I pray that we get on so on fire for Christ. That in this community, they will see and they will ask and they will wonder why, what is going on at Mount Vernon? What is so on fire out there? What is so bright out there in Mount Vernon? that the people in this community have no other choice but to flock to here to figure out what is going on. And when they get here, they find the power of God moving in the lives of this church. But see, if we, if we don't let the fire in our lives in here, the fire won't be out there. If we don't allow God to move in our lives in here, God can't use us out there. If we can't be that light in here, church, if we can't let our light shine in here this morning, how are we ever going to let that light shine for us out there? And what happens is we come, we just become a piece of the darkness that's out there, that's waiting right outside of those doors. Guys, there's people hurting out there. There's people that are suffering right outside of those doors. There's people in situations that they wish they never got themselves into. There's people that picked up a phone call that wish they never got a phone call. There's people that got a phone call this morning wishing they would have never got a phone call. My family received a phone call last night that I wish they would have never got. My dad's brother got sick and he went into the hospital and they got a report that Cancer has ate up his whole body. And that he's not going to come home. It was a phone call that they didn't want. 
People are hurting out there, guys. But if we're honest with ourselves, there's people right here hurting this morning, sitting in this church. And I don't care how much you want to cover it up, how much makeup you think you got to put on, what you got to do to hide it. My God sees past through all of that, church. My God sees right in the heart of everyone in here this morning. He sees your hurt. He sees your pain. And God wants to move in your hearts this morning. But church, life's hard. I know that. I know it's not easy. It's hard when you're 50 years old and you're working for a company for 20 years and the boss walks in and says, listen, you've got to go. We don't need you anymore. It's hard to start over. It's hard to come home to your family and say, listen, I don't have a job anymore. It's hard. Church, it's hard. It's not easy. It's hard when you're married and you're raising children and your spouse dies unexpectedly. It's hard. It's hard handling the tragedies of this world when you work so hard at something just to watch it fall apart at the last moment. And you find yourself asking God, why? God, why now? God, wasn't I at church every Sunday? God, wasn't I in the youth group? God, wasn't I in Sunday school? God, don't I work the nursery for you? God, don't I, don't I spend time in prayer with you? So why God now? Why this? And you find yourself, like so many other people, asking God, why? One of the hardest things for a pastor to do is when you hear a situation and we don't have the answer, ain't it right, brother? And we have to say, we don't know. Well, we got to have faith and trust that God knows what he's doing in that situation. And sometimes that's not the answer we want to hear, is it? Sometimes that's not what we want to hear. And so we even get even angry and we get even upset. 9-11 was a time that shook this nation. 9-11 was a time that pierced every American heart across America. It was a time that we would never forget. It was a time that you, most of you guys in here remember that date. You remember where you were at when you heard the news. You remember watching it on TV. Do you remember asking God why? Do you remember feeling heartbroken? And this was no different for a young lady. She was sitting there. She had seen on the news what was going on. And she remembers going to the telephone and call her husband because she said her husband was working for the New York Fire Department. And so she ran to the telephone and she called her husband. And she said, do you know what's going on? And he said, yeah, we just got the call. I've got to go. And she said, she hollered out these words on the phone. She said, please come home. She knew the situation didn't look good. She knew that her husband had to go. And all she cared about was that he made it home, that he came home. She watched on that couch as people ran in and people ran out. And she watched like so many of us watched that day. The trade centers start to collapse and start to fall. And she didn't know where her husband was at in all that mess. And she said right there, she said, God, just bring him home. Bring him home. A few years later, to her surprise, that was the last phone call that she ever talked to her husband. 
That was the last time she ever heard his voice. A few, few years later, she was at home one morning, and a doorbell came and he rang. And she opened the door, and there was a young lady standing there. And she said, ma'am, she said, you don't know who I am. But she said, I would love to come in and talk to you for just a few moments. And so she invited her in, and they sat on that same couch that she watched her life fall apart on. And she said, this young lady started telling her, she said, I don't know you, but I knew your husband. She said, the day that the World Trade Centers got attacked, she said, I was in there working. And she said, and it went to disaster. And she said, people started running everywhere. And she goes, I went to run. And she said, this beam fell, and it fell on top of me. And it blocked me in there. And she said, and I started screaming for help. And she said, out of the midst of the fog, the smoke, in the dark, she said, I seen somebody coming with a light. And she said, all I could do is focus on that light and scream out to that light. And she said, this man, this firefighter came and he kneeled down beside me and he said, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. I'm going to get you out of here. And he called in for help because he couldn't remove the beam that was on me. And she goes, and I just stayed there. And the whole time she said, your husband was comforting me and telling me it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And she said, I looked up at him. And she said, I know it's going to be okay. She said, because I serve a God that's bigger than this. And he's got me in his hands. And as this woman sat there and listened to this story, this young lady said, as I said those words to your husband, I felt like God told me he doesn't know me. And she said, I come here this morning because I felt like God wanted me to tell you too that that day that he rescued me was the day that God rescued your husband because I led him to Christ that day and he accepted Christ while he was sitting there trying to comfort me God had me there so I could tell him about the love of Jesus. And he accepted Christ. And she goes, and not only that, I want to I wanna tell you one more thing. She said, because your husband thought he was rescuing one person, but he didn't. See, what your husband didn't know is I was pregnant at the time. So not only did he rescue me, he rescued a second person. And she said, and your husband, I will never forget to the point where what he had done for me. And she said, I want you to know that I named my child after your husband. God brought him home. God showed up on the scene. She sat on that couch and she said, God, bring him home. And God said, I answered your prayers. I brought him home. I didn't bring him to your home, but I brought him to the home that he needs to be at. And now he is safe. I answered your prayers. God hears us, guys. God hears our cries. He hears our hearts. And he answers the prayers. Even though we don't feel like he does, I'm telling you, he hears them and he answers them. And it might not just be the same answer that you want, but God is working. God is working in our lives. He's working in our problems. He's working in our situations. If you got your Bibles with you, if you turn to John 11 this morning, we're going to look at a familiar passage, a passage that has been preached 100,000 times. But this morning I want to pull out something that I feel like God has put on my heart. In this passage we see a, a story about when a flame went out. We see a story about a situation that doesn't look good. A problem that doesn't look good. We see a situation and a story 
that we find so many of us asking the same question, why God? Why? John chapter 11, verse 1. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, the sickness will not end in death. Now it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and Mary. So when he heard this, Lazarus was sick. He stayed where he was at two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you're going back? Jesus answered, are there, tw- th- are there not 12 hours of daylight? And anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by this word's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus had fallen asleep. But I'm going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Sometimes you just got to say what it is. Sometimes you can't just sugarcoat something. Sometimes it is what it is. And this is what Jesus is saying. Listen, he's not asleep. He's dead. Sometimes you got to say it plainly. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Then Thomas, also known as them, said to the rest of the disciples, let us go that we may die with him. On their arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem. And many Jews had come comforting them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would have died. But I know now that even now that God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered again, I know he will rise again in the resurrection in the last day, God. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even through they die, and whoever lives by believing me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? Do you believe these words? And Martha said, yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you're the Messiah. She had, after she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and he's asking for you. He's asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now, Jesus had not entered the village, but was still at the same place that Martha had met him. When, Jews had been, when the Jews had been with Mary in the house comforting her, notice how quickly she got up and went out. They followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would have not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and trouble. Where have you laid him? He asked, where have you laid him? See, in this story, we see Martha and Mary and Lazarus, okay? They know Jesus, okay? A few stories back, Martha and Mary were close friends with Jesus. They even had Jesus over at their house, and Martha was in there, and she was cooking them dinner. She had the fried chicken and the mashed potatoes and the collard greens. That good old southern hospitality was cooking up in that kitchen, And Mary was in the living room washing Jesus' feet, wiping it with her hair. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm wiping anybody's feet, I better know them really good. 
before I get down there and start washing somebody's feet, more or less drying it with my hair. But Martha and Mary, they knew Jesus. They loved Jesus. Jesus loved them. But something happens in this story. See, they wasn't cooking up a meal. Mary wasn't at the feet of Jesus, washing his feet. See, in this story, we see a, a situation come about. We see a problem happen. We see that phone call come in. We see tragedy hit home for Martha and Mary. How many of you ever had a tragedy hit home before? And Martha and Mary did exactly like every one of us would do. They knew Jesus. And they knew that if anybody could help out right now, they knew if that anybody could handle this situation, it was going to be Jesus. So the first thing they did is they sent word for God. They sent word to Jesus. Call out for Jesus. We need Jesus now. We need him right now. After 9-11, the Sundays following it broke records in church attendance all across this nation. Why? Why? Because when something happens to our lives, we run. We call out to Jesus. The highest attendance for churches. But for some reason, so many people didn't get the answers they were looking for. Because those attendance records went right back down a few weeks later. They went looking for answers and saying, Jesus, why? And for whatever reason, they didn't get them. They didn't get them. But they sent word to Jesus. They knew what to do. They were sitting in the house. And they got the report that Lazarus was sick. They got the phone call. And they knew that Lazarus was in need of help. And so they said, we got to send for Jesus. We got to get Jesus on the scene. And so that they sent word and they sent a messenger and they, told, they said, go find Jesus. Go get Jesus and bring him back to here. Go tell him the one that he loves, his friend, Lazarus, was sick. Tell him that he needs him now. And so the messenger went out and he went into the town and he's looking for Jesus. And he goes around and he's looking and he's trying to figure out where's Jesus at. And finally, he sees Jesus. And he runs up to Jesus and he, and he taps him on the shoulder and he said, Hey, Jesus, Jesus. And Jesus is like, what, what? He said, I got to tell you something. I got to tell you something. And I, I've been looking for you for, for a long time and, and I, I need to let you know something. There's something going on and we need you. And Jesus is like, well, what is it? And he said, well, you know, you know your friend Lazarus? You know Martha and Mary? The one that was washing your feet? Well, well, Lazarus is sick, and, and he needs you. He needs you to come right now. Jesus' response is, it ain't going to end in death. His sickness will not end in death. It'll be okay. And he turned around, and, and he went back to doing his Jesus thing. He went back to doing all these amazing things, healing the blind, healing the sick, making the lame walk. And I can imagine this messenger's face, and he was like, taps on his shoulder again, and he said, Jesus, maybe you didn't hear me. Maybe you didn't understand what I was saying. Your friend, the one that loves you, the one that spent time with you, he needs you now. I know you're doing all this, all this other stuff, but that can wait. We need you back home. We need you over here. You can come back doing your own, your thing afterwards. But we need you now. Jesus says, I know. 
I know. But I'll be there in a couple days. I'll be there in a couple days. That wasn't the answer that he needed. That wasn't the answer that he wanted to go back and give Martha and Mary. I don't know how many of you guys know, man, if you haven't learned this yet, when your wife is mad and upset, you don't want to have to tell her no. You don't want to tell her what she don't want to hear. And so I can imagine this messenger, and he's headed back, and, and he's probably thinking about, what, can I what am I going to say? Man, I can't go back there and tell him that. I can't give him that message. Man, what am I going to do? i got to come up with a story, and I've got to stick to it. I might have fell asleep in the attic in the, or the thing outside, but it's my story, and I've got to stick to it. Now, come on, I know you guys don't listen to gospel all the time. You'd be listening to some country music out there. My story, and I've got to stick to it. But he goes back and he sees Martha and Mary. And Martha and Mary sees him coming. And Martha runs up and she's like, where's Jesus? Where's he at? Lazarus is in there. He needs him now. He's got to show up. He's got to get there. He's got to get there. And the messengers, well, about that. Well, and they're, they're like, Where, where's Jesus? I, just get out of the way. I, I need to see Jesus. Where's he at? I, I don't see him coming. Well, let me, let, me, let me get this straight. Let me, let me make sure I got this right. He said, it's not going to end in death. And he's not coming. Just block it. Because he knew it was the bad news. He knew not to say anything. But he said, he's not coming. He's not coming. And Martha and Mary, what do you mean he ain't coming? What do you mean he's not going to show up? What do you mean when I ask him to show up and he's not going to show up? And they got angry and they got mad. And they went back home. And they said, whatever. He ain't going to show up. What? As much as I loved him, and he ain't going to show up. He's not going to answer my prayers. And a few days went by, and people had gathered around after the funeral, and they were trying to comfort her, comfort Martha and Mary. And word came in and said, Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. And I can imagine what was going through their minds, and, and Martha being Martha and who she is, and she's, what do you mean he's coming? What, he's going to show up now? Wait, wait, he thinks he can just come when he wants to come? We sent word for him four days ago. We needed him four days ago in our situation. Some of us needed God to show up yesterday, last week, last month. And it says, what do you mean he ain't coming? What do you mean he's coming now? And Martha says, come on, Mary, let's go out there. Let's go meet Jesus. As we read, and Mary said, I'm good. No, I'm going to stay right here. I don't want to go out there. I don't have nothing to say. I don't have any more prayers. I don't have any more worship in me. I'll stay right here. And Martha, being the woman she is, she ran out to Jesus. And Jesus had not even entered into the home, and she ran out there where she felt, she ran out there and she met Jesus right where he was at. And she began to tell Jesus, man, Jesus, if you'd have been here, if you'd have showed up, if you would have answered our prayers, we wouldn't be in this situation. If you'd have just answered when we called out to you, we wouldn't be hurting today. This situation would have came out with a better outcome. But now you show up. Now you want to do something. And yeah, I know that even now you can ask God and he'll give you whatever you want. I know that. But why now, God? Why now? Jesus said he will rise. Martha answered back, I know he will rise, Jesus. 
in the last days. Jesus said, I am the resurrection. I am the life. He said, Martha, do you believe me? Do you believe me now? Do you still have faith in me? She said, yeah, it's Jesus. Yeah, I believed in you. I believed in you four days ago when I said word for you and you didn't show up. But yeah, I, I still believe in you. Yeah, I believe in you. And she turned her way. She walked back to the house. And when she got back in there, she went over to Mary. And she said, Mary, Jesus is asking for you. Jesus is calling out to you. He wants you. He's asking for you this morning. And Mary, a few, mo few moments ago, Mary didn't want to go out. But guys, there's something about when you know that Jesus is calling out to you. There's something about it when you finally hear that Jesus is calling out to you. Nothing can hold you down. No pain, no sorrow, no situation can hold you back from going to Jesus when Jesus is calling out to you. And he says, I want, I want you, I want to talk to you, I want to see you. Nothing can hold you back. And when Mary heard that Jesus was asking for her, she got up, immediately it says, and she ran. She didn't walk, she didn't take her time. She ran to the feet of Jesus, guys. She ran out to Jesus. And when she got to Jesus, guys, when she got to Jesus, she fell down on her knees. And she said the same thing Martha said. She said, Jesus, Jesus, if you'd have been here, oh, if you would have just showed up when I called out to you, oh, when that telephone come in, oh, if you was just was there at the doctor's office when that doctor walked in, Jesus, if you would have just been here, my brother would still be alive. The situation would have had another outcome. That doctor would have came in with a smile on his face. Jesus, if you would have just been here. Jesus, if you would have just been here, I wouldn't have had to cut myself. Jesus, if you'd have been here, they wouldn't have had to take their life. Jesus, if you'd have been there at my job, I would still have a job. Jesus, if you were there in my marriage, I would have still wouldn't be sitting here signing divorce papers. Jesus, if you'd have just been there. Martha and Mary lifted up the same prayer that day. They called out to Jesus because they needed him. And when they didn't get their answer they wanted, hurt sat in, angry sat in. And a few days later, Jesus showed up on scene. And again, we see both sisters lifting up the same prayer. Guys, if you don't get anything out of this message today, I want you to grasp onto this. Worship moves the heart of God. Worship moves the heart of God. Martha and Mary lifted up the same prayer. They said the same thing. God, if you'd have been here, but Martha ran out and she gave a piece of her mind and angry and God knew she was angry. And she gave a piece of her mind and she told God how she felt. And then she just turned around and just walked off. Like there, God, I told you. But Mary did something so different. See, when Mary was hurt, 
Mary was angry over the same situation. And when she felt Jesus calling out to her, she ran to Jesus. And the Bible says that Jesus had yet moved. He hasn't moved. And he was standing in the same place where Martha left him, Mary found him. And when Mary got there, she went to her knees and she worshiped God. She lifted up prayers and she wept at the feet of Jesus. And at that moment, the Bible tells us that Jesus was deeply moved. At that moment, he was deeply moved and he said, Mary, where did you lay him? Where did you lay your problem? Where did you lay your situation? Where did you lay this thing that's got you this way? Take me to him. A heart of worship moves the heart of God. Guys, when you come to the feet of Jesus with your situation, with your problems, moves the heart of God. 9-11 was a day that shook this nation. It was a day that we hurt. It was a day that we asked God, why? Why? That day was for Martha and Mary when they sent word for God. And God didn't show up. They'll never forget that day. We'll never forget 9-11. That woman that lost her husband in 9-11 will never forget that day. 2009 was a year that shook my life. See, 2009, my wife gave birth to a beautiful young girl. And I remember holding her. And I remember looking at her and seeing how beautiful she was. But I also remember seeing how beautiful, but how sick she was. And I remember holding her and I'm telling God, God, why? God, you got to show up. God, I need you here. This is the moment that I need you. God, you got to show up. God, you've been so faithful and everything else. God, you've blessed me in so many ways. God, today is the day that I need it all to come together right now. And when I watched her take her last breath, hurt sat in, angry sat in. But at that moment, I realized I could do two things. At that moment, I could either curse God or just praise God. And as hard as it was, as angry as I was, I still said, God, I still love you. God, you're still worthy of it all. And maybe I don't understand why. Maybe I don't have the answers. But I know that you do, and I know that you're faithful among all. And that you got everything under control. And I sat there. And right there, 2009, even though my flame was blown out, even though my light started to fade, I said, God, I won't stop praising you. God, I won't stop spreading your love. I won't start sharing what you've done in my life. I didn't understand. I still don't. But I got to have faith and trust in God's plans. I knew God heard my answers that day. 
I knew God heard that woman's answers as she sat on that couch and watched that tragedy fall upon her husband. 9-11 was the day that shook the nation. 2009 was the day that shook mine, that blew my candle out. What's your date? What's your month? What's your year that blew out your candle? That blew out your light? Guys, it's okay to get mad. It's okay to get angry. God knows we're mad. God knows we get angry. So there's no need to hide it. There's no need to try to cover it up. Jesus knows what's in our hearts. But the question is, this morning, is where are you tucking your hurt? Where have you tucked in your pain? Where have you taken the thing that blew out your candle? Can you still worship God after it all? Can you still praise God after it all? Can you still say, I love you, Jesus? See, when you realize the only thing you can do is to fall at the feet of Jesus in worship and remember your past is your past. Your past failures are things that try to hold you back, can't hold you back anymore because your future is your destination. You can't let that stuff continue to hold you back. You can't let these things continue to hold you from coming to the feet of, the, of Jesus to come into the altar. You can't let that block you from Jesus calling into your life. Because if you do, your candle will never light up. If you let that stuff continue to hold you back, God won't be able to move in your life. You got to give it up, guys. You got to lay it at the feet of Jesus. Every problem, every situation, everything that you're going through. Everything that tried to keep you in bed this morning. Everything that keeps you in that altar or in that chair. You got to give it to Jesus. Because God didn't create us to stay down. He didn't create us to stay in the darkness. He didn't create us to, he created us to shine. If you look in the book of Genesis, my God didn't create darkness. He created the light, and he spoke light into darkness. And when he spoke light into darkness, he seen the light. And he said, the light is good, my friends. The light is good. Light your candle back up. Light your flame back up. Give it to Jesus, guys. I don't know what's keeping you in darkness. I don't know what's kept you from coming to the feet of Jesus. Maybe you don't know where to go. Maybe you never came to the feet of Jesus before. Maybe you don't know what it means to spend time with God. And for this young lady, she went to church one Sunday, and she went to the pastor right after service, and she said, Pastor, I need you to do me a big favor. The pastor said, what, what can I do for you? And she goes, well, my dad's sick, and he, has, and he don't come to church. And she goes, and actually... I don't ever remember my dad saying anything about God. She goes, I don't even know if he knows him. But he needs, he needs God. And she goes, I want to ask you if you would take God to him. Will you take church to him? Will you share the gospel with my dad? And he said, I will. And a few days later, he showed up at this young girl's door and he knocked on the door and he, she answered and she said, come on in. She said, I'm so glad you showed up. She said, I didn't know if you were going to come or not, but I'm glad that you came. And she walked him through the house, and she came to this room, and she opened the door, and he walked in, and she goes, I'll let you be. And she shut the door behind. And he, ended, he went to introduce himself to this young man, or this man, as he watched him lay in his bed, and the sickness falling on him. And he said, I don't know if, who I am, but he goes, I guess you were expecting me because I see the chair next to your bed. 
And he looked over to the chair and he looked at the pastor and he said, I didn't know who you are and I don't know why you're here. He goes, well, your daughter last Sunday came to church and he said that she was afraid of your situation. She said it didn't look good. She said as far as she can remember, she's never even heard you say the word of God. And she said she was afraid that you didn't know God, that you didn't know where to go. And he said, well, for a long time I didn't. And he says, but as I sit in this bed, I find myself talking more and more to God. And he said, and every day I get up and I crawl over to that door and I shut the door because I don't want them to hear me talking in here because I don't want them to think I'm crazy. He goes, and I hope that you don't think I'm crazy. But he goes, after I shut the door, he goes, I crawl over to this chair. And he goes, I just lay my head on the chair. And he goes, because I do that because I picture Jesus sitting in that chair. And he goes, there's moments in my day that I just want to get out of this bed, out of this situation, and I want to go up there and I just want to lay in his lap. And I want Jesus just to hold me. And I spend hours just talking to him. After the pastor and him got to talking, he got done and he prayed for the man and he walked out and the young daughter was sitting there and she said, Pastor, she said, did you bring Jesus to him? He said, no, ma'am. He brought Jesus to me. A few days later, the pastor was in his office and a phone call came in. And it was the young girl and she said, I have some sad news to tell you. She said, my dad had passed away through the night. And she said, and I was asking because you got to share the gospel with him. She said, I was asking if you would do his funeral. And he said, I would be blessed too. And she said, before I let you go, she goes, can I tell you something that's crazy? And he said, yes, ma'am. She said, well, for some reason, Daddy did the strangest thing before he died. And he said, what's that? She said, right before he died, she said, he must have crawled out of his bed because we found him with his head laying on the chair next to his bed. Guys, he knew where to go. When times didn't look good, he knew where to go when the situation started looking bad. Do you? Say, come forward and play some music. My question is here this morning, where are you at? In your situation. I believe God wants to bring revival to this church. I believe God wants to move in the hearts of his people right here. But I believe there's some candles in that that need to be relight this morning. Because for whatever reason, they've been blown out. Can you still praise God this morning? Are you sitting back and letting it hold you down? Where are you at this morning? As they begin to play. Guys, don't let Satan hold you back no longer. If Satan's holding you back from the altar, what else is he holding you back from? Come this morning. Take this time. Spend time with Jesus this morning. What do you say? Are you going to let it hold you back this morning? Or are you going to come this morning? It's your time. The altar is open. Oh, all to Jesus.
Jesus, I surrender all. To him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. All to Jesus, I surrender, make me Savior, holy thine. Let me feel thy Holy Spirit truly know that thou